course is wonderful. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of you for your work for world peace, everything that you're doing. Um, the work of this organization as we see. I'm, I'm very close to it, but not maybe working directly with it, uh, but I'm so impressed actually when you put it together, the range of activities and the thought behind it and the dedication of this amazing network of, of people who just come together because of the like minds and the shared concerns. And I think that's tremendously hopeful. I appreciate that uh, summary from, from uh, Mr. Brown. So, um, also looking at your program today, those who put it together, it's a very inspiring and exciting looking program. Mm -hmm. Do you think so? Yes. yes. yes it really speaks well of uh, everything. So, uh, my topic today is just to look a little bit at this idea of building one family under God and take a certain line or certain perspective, I suppose. So, um, I start by asking you a question, ah. a rhetorical question. You don't all have to answer me, but, but you can be thinking about this one, all right? That is, when you think of my country, my country, then what do you think of? What is my country? So thinking about that, maybe you know instantly, maybe you're not sure, you know, because we move around today quite a lot, don't we? And even sometimes our countries change. So we think about that. I want to expand on this answer using the words of the founder of Universal Peace Federation, uh, Sun Myung Moon, and words from other uh, of the world's great religious traditions. And I'll introduce one aspect, really just one aspect, of our founder's thought. And I hope that it stimulates you to think further about this kind of topic and um, also to work even more dedicatedly uh, for world peace. Our UPF founder uh, said that everyone has their home country where they are born and live. But in a larger sense, the entire world that God created is my country. So there's his answer to that question. Eh? Uh, we have to transcend nationalism, he said. A people should emerge whose hearts transcend ethnic loyalties, which loves other peoples more than its own people. So put here, this is back in 1970. We have to transcend nationalism. A people should emerge whose hearts transcend ethnic loyalties and which loves other peoples more than its own people. That's perhaps a little bit of a radical way of thinking, isn't it? You love other peoples more than your own people, your nationality or country. What would it take to do that? What he's getting to is something in his kind of philosophy. I think is perhaps described by the extent of self-centeredness or selfishness. We have to remove those barriers, but it's not just a personal thing. You have to even think of it on a national level, how to break down those barriers and for a nation to be uh, as concerned or more concerned for its sister or brother nations than even for its own well-being. That kind of spirit, that kind of outlook would undoubtedly change the world, wouldn't it? If we could come to that point. And the seeds of that are in the philosophies and the great teachings of uh, humanity, our wonderful kind of legacy. Uh, the German, kind of, who's a psychiatrist turned philosopher, I don't know if you've come across the name Karl Jaspers, yes. then uh, he identified a particular <coughs> period in the development of human civilization. Uh, this period 600 to 400 BCE, before uh, Christ or before the Common Era. And he uh, coined the phrase axial period. He said this was the axial period, a really changing time around which history rotated in a sense. Everything turns on this period where simultaneously and independently 
around the world, he said. There is a spiritual awakening taking place. And somewhere in his writings, he's implying that modern man as we know him today, this is where uh, this aspect of our humanity emerged. You can pinpoint it to this time in history. And uh, interestingly, it was kind of taking shape independently and simultaneously in different places around the world. Because it was certainly, we didn't benefit back in those days uh, from the kind of communication that we have nowadays. Right? So uh, the world was kind of isolated more into various pockets, but nevertheless, there was still an awakening taking place. So if we take the kind of world map at that time, uh, the kind of lighter green yellow there is uh, like the Roman Empire and many other nations kind of outside of that with their own long history. And this is, of course, a huge <coughs> topic. But you can see that um, uh, around this time, in the same kind of era, then major developments are taking place. Uh, the time of the Han Dynasty in China, you've got Confucius and Lao Tzu giving rise to Taoism, you've got uh, Buddha in southern India, you've got Zoroaster in uh, Persia and uh, the Parsi uh, faith coming out of that. You've got also around this time a uh, person that, um, interestingly, Father Moon in his writing uh, identifies as one of the great kind of sense of history, that is Socrates, not normally thought of as a spiritual leader, but because of the contribution to human thought and civilization, a person of insight who uh, lived his life based on the principles which he taught as a very profound and influential person, uh, giving rise to the kind of foundations of uh, Western civilization, European civilization. So it had a huge impact. So we see uh, these and more, there were developments, of course, in Judaism from the time of uh, Malachi, there were uh, developments in uh, India and uh, other cultures as well at that time, which were like a flowering of humanity, either new religions emerging or old religions going through times of great uh, reformation. So it's very fascinating how this comes about. There's another scholar you might have come across, English scholar Karen Armstrong, and you really know her, a very wonderful writer and a person who's researched deeply uh, the, uh, the heart of uh, world faiths and can write very lucidly about that, really uh, more than the average scholar, I think, right? She, she's talking about her experience. Um, she wrote about this period as well, in quite a thick book called The Great Transformation, which I really recommend to you. And she's talking about this axial period and uh, uh, how great changes came about. In the introduction there already, she's saying this, as far as these sages were concerned, these founders of religion or reformers who came around in this period, 600 to 400 BCE, as far as these sages were concerned, respect for the sacred rights of all human beings, and not orthodox belief with a small o, this was religion, the sacred rights of all human beings. If people behaved with kindness and generosity to their fellows, they could save the world. This was a kind of impassioned feeling that people were having in these different places at different times through this kind of um, process of enlightenment. And then she says, and this is perhaps going beyond the normal academic uh, posture to actually think of how we need to do something based on this. She said, we need to rediscover this ethos. We must learn to live and behave as though people in countries remote from our own are as important as ourselves. Interesting conclusion, isn't it? Right? Very fascinating. And a great message for this time. You might have come across her work also with the um, I yes. think it's called the, uh, to do with compassion or the compassion trust. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I think these days we have mm -hmm. ghost writers. People will just throw the uh, ideas and the ghost writers. Miss Kennedy, let them talk for us. Yes. Uh, you know, she's a person who writes from her experience. Right? 
Um, around this time, we have the emergence of Greek civilization, right? And this, of course, carries on to, into the uh, Roman Empire. According to, I put this up because it's in your news, it was on the front page of your yes, time. Yes. <laughs> excuse the nudity, but this is European culture. So I, I feel like excuse in this particular instance. But, uh, this is great. Uh, what a magnificent piece, now on loan to the uh, Hermitage Museum. And some people may, or may say on loan to the British Museum as well. But uh, there's an excuse about that. But, uh, magnificent piece of uh, sculpture, just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, I always wondered why a lot of these uh, Greek sculptures, they had noses missing or <laughs> arms missing, and you thought this is just uh, because of the ravages of time somehow. Well, no, but actually it wasn't. It wasn't. It was, uh, and you, you hear this explanation really when you go to Greece, right? And <laughs> you go to the museum there. It was when the Parthenon was used as a Christian church, a little bit later on in its history, then the uh, Christians, very offended by these kind of sculptures, put their ladders up and they took their hammers and they smashed oh. these sculptures. <coughs> they wanted to deliberately defaced them. Yes. Well, of course, there's a coming together of very different cultures and different views of life. But what Father Will was <coughs> saying in his writing is that Actually, we need that coming together. It's almost like uh, the very necessary unity of mind and body in a disciplined religious life or a true human life. We need to have those things work together. We need to understand each other. And these cultures actually were poised to come together in a very significant way 2,000 years ago on the basis of that time of transformation and preparation. So it, it bears looking at again, actually, and uh, I encourage you to do that. He was saying that um, certainly there are more, we could say, external accomplishments of the Greco-Roman Empire, or that's where those external accomplishments lay, although, of course, with the Greek philosophers and other things which they produced, it's not all external, if you understand what I mean. Um, but it takes that kind of aspect of the body at the time. And then we see uh, it could have been saved from what was, in the end, the kind of eventual implosion of that culture through an internal or a spiritual revolution. How would that have come about at, the, at that time? He says it would have come about through a reformed Judaism if Jesus had been accepted and allowed to live and work and teach and develop his ideas and those could then eventually be incorporated into the kind of cultural sphere at that time, like again a coming together of mind and body. Very interesting idea. It shows somewhere that there was a lost opportunity. Not only that, something perhaps even more tragic. So he says, everything hinged on Jesus being accepted and being allowed to live, teach, and fully develop that particular role that he felt called to in his lifetime, yeah. and it was something that he was not allowed to do. So, lost opportunity. You could say, actually, a tragedy of monumental proportions, if you look at it that way. And it set back this kind of quest for a one-world nation where people could live in harmony and to this day those world religions prepared for that potential unity at that time have developed separately and they've developed their uh, own unique and very precious cultures which Father was teaching really respects in their way from first principles. It reckons that uh, God is working for those different traditions and it's part of a greater plan if you like so God is working for that. And um, the national foundation, which was built up through this extraordinary history of the Jewish people in particular, then that was destroyed and her people were scattered. And uh, it's uh, really only in, in the next uh, hundred, uh, 400 years or so we see that the greatness of the Roman Empire as was, which of course was built on slavery and uh, was morally unenlightened, uh, it collapsed, right? It collapsed under its own weight in that sense. Plunging Europe into what has come to be known as the Dark Ages, use that expression quite often. 
So actually, in his uh, thinking, interestingly, Father Moon has um, identified not just one axial period, but four different periods like that in human history. And his analysis of history is the kind of second part of what we call the exposition of divine principle that I encourage you to have a look at. And, um, he says there's one period which leads into that 120 year period of the United Kingdom of Israel, this kind of high point of that uh, culture, uh, King uh, Saul, David, and Solomon at that time, which is kind of biblical history. The second, we just looked at with the map that was on the screen, this time of the flowering of different uh, cultures and religions around the world. And uh, the third period is that which leads into the um, United Christian Kingdom of Charlemagne in Europe. Mm. That was another potential time for great development and great unity and establishment of a, a kind of peaceful reign on earth, if you like. Because the time leading up to that particular period was also matched around the world with a lot of interesting developments. You had the rise of the Byzantine Empire, you had the Gupta Empire, in India, which brought a great age of peace, a kind of golden age of uh, peace and prosperity that enabled the pursuit of scientific and artistic endeavors. And also further east, you had the Tang Dynasty in China, uh, also described as a golden age, right? So you talk about Greece as the golden age, there were golden ages in other parts of the world at other times, right? And I can't cover every scenario, so there may be a a culture or a tradition that's more close to your heart and experience, which you could also fit into this wider scheme. There's something moving behind human history at certain times to uh, encourage or set up the means for a real uh, transformation towards a peaceful, uh, unified world where we could call ourselves one family under God, one family under Amen common values centered on our understanding of the spiritual uh, nature of humankind. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Is it curious? Is it new to you? Maybe you're all students of this already. Huh? Uh, so the fourth time, the fourth axial period, is the time that we're living in now. Uh, the years of preparation for this time included developments over the last kind of 400 years. Uh, this uh, included, especially centering on European Christianity and uh, situation, uh, you had the movement of the uh, Renaissance, which was after all a rebirth of Hellenism. It was that kind of flowering, um, looking back to that time. And also we had the Reformation, which was a return to the roots of uh, Christianity, which itself developed out of that Hebraic culture. So it's a kind of resurgence of that uh, dichotomy there of Hellenism and Hebraism. And it comes to the fore as preparation for a time. It's not with kind of built-in conflicts, but if those could be resolved, it could create a platform under which a new kind of era of peace and prosperity shared by all could be realized. Of course, this is speculation. I and mean, we're looking at a lot of the what-ifs of history here. But you know, we're still in this time. We're still faced with the opportunities uh, as a legacy of these great changes which took place to use our, uh, I think it's common sense, right? <laughs> and learn to live together and learn to break down our barriers and break down the artificial walls which are broken up and see the commonality between us and act in a mature way be able to relate together as people of different uh, religious and cultural backgrounds, uh, to enjoy our differences and not to let them separate us. So this, of course, this theory, you can see how it underpins so much of what UPF is doing when you look at the various projects. So perhaps we're working backwards here. <laughs> if, you, if you had this talk before, it would have been illustrated or been illustrated, but that's not a bad way to... to uh, um, so as with any birth, uh, the prospect of new life or some new order is not without struggle, right? It, uh, it happens. It's a painful thing. 
And historically, this is a working out of the struggle between good and evil. And historically, it's, between, it's a struggle between brothers, largely. So Father Moon likens this process uh, to the biblical des description of the struggle uh, between Cain and Abel. This goes back to the kind of second generation of humanity and the brothers who fought one who killed the other as setting some pattern in place uh, whereby brother would kill brother and there would be enmity between different groups or sections of humanity which should be one family living peaceably together. So it bears some kind of sense, right? It's not uh, illogical to say that humankind started from one beginning or one family. It's not. And you know yourself, you maybe have first-hand experience of how struggles or feuds in a family can go on and on and on, as Mark Brand said. If, it's, if there's been struggle, uh, say, between a husband and wife for a number of years, 25 years, you're not going to change that quickly. Sometimes those things are in generations of families where one half wouldn't talk to the other half, right? And in the end, the descendants, they don't quite know why we don't like those people. We just don't like them, right? <laughs> And we want to put up some kind of mental barrier between them and us. Um, it's a tragedy, really. So, uh, Father Moon, as I said, likens this uh, struggle historically as coming out of that Cain and Abel kind of wrong tradition, if you like. So, in the 20th century, how, what does this, how does this take shape? We see it take shape on a worldwide level as a struggle between communism, which is the kind of fruit of a Cain-type view of life, that's his expression, and democracy, which is the fruit of the able-type view of life. But they're brothers. They should take the best of both worlds and find a way to harmonize and live together. Right? So it's a big challenge. And we're firmly, I think, in this final time of struggle. So religiously speaking, it's an end time, and there are many hopeful signs. We see extraordinary developments in science and technology. We see uh, that the means of solving many problems are really within our grasp, actually. <coughs> but it's also, I'm sure you'll agree, a very worrying and fearful time that we're living through uh, at the moment. There are many misguided forces that are working to undermine our quest for peace and unity. They're succumbing to this kind of national level selfishness, if you like, that we identified in the beginning. And we talked of the need to transcend that kind of nationalism. Also, we have a, an attack continuously on the kind of moral foundations of our society that uh, Mark Brown alluded to at the end of his talk. And I pick on that, up on that as well. I was just in Germany talking with people there. They say there are now, um, 300 higher level institutions in Germany that have departments of what they call gender mainstreaming. Have you heard this expression? Uh, gender mainstreaming works on a supposition that gender differences, differences between male and female, are just a product of society, of nurture, and not of nature. And these departments are mostly set up by feminist scholars, and it's in, you know, getting into the schools, and it's being promulgated in every area, area of society as though this is universal truth. But, you know, I challenge it. I don't think it is. So, is there a greater plan or planner at work behind history? Uh, well, it's curious. When you look at these periods, these axial periods, it seems to be that things are moving at a pace which is much beyond, or a scale which is beyond the influence of any generation or any individuals. So time is coming around when there's an opportunity for transformation. So what is producing that? Uh, we would say, uh, unification view, is that that's a kind of spiritual preparation. This is God's plan behind history. And I know that's not a popular view today, right? But I think it's one we should revisit. We should really revisit this. If you examine the world-level traditions, uh, religious traditions, 
then, interestingly, they transcend nationality, <laughs> don't they? They have endured, in many cases, persecution, sometimes attempts to annihilate them. But the spirit within them and within their adherence has surmounted these kind of challenges. In the world today, I kind of put it to you, we see examples of bad religion. Yeah? You need to think what that might be, right? Bad religion. But as Rabbi uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs says, <coughs> wrote a very interesting uh, book, The Great Partnership, about uh, the coming together of the joint mission of religion and science. And in there he describes how the answer to bad science, and that does happen from time to time, right? There's bad science. Well, the answer to bad science is what? No science? No, it's good science, right? You need good science. And it's good science that produces progress and allows us to go forward. Bad science doesn't do that, actually. Mm. So, we have a wonderful tradition in that area that produces progress and worthwhile developments. It's very truth-seeking, actually, in the area of science. Likewise, the answer, he says, to bad religion is not no religion, as people would like to campaign for, which is why they always use the example of bad religion, right, to, to further their point. Uh, what we need is good religion. We need to get back to those roots of our various traditions mm -hmm. and we need conscientious people to come forward and take up the challenges. Uh, isn't that what UPF is doing, folks? Absolutely. I think so, right? So, brothers and sisters, look around you. I mean, literally, look around you today. Look to your left and right and in front and behind. Who do you see, right? Nice faces. Mm. <laughs> Lots of nice faces, my business. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, people are naturally drawn here, people are naturally drawn here, who have already got this aspiration, right, for one world family living in their hearts. Right? It naturally draws people together that way. Uh, this longing will never die, I tell you, because it's an original plan for humankind that comes from our Creator. And you are right up here, right, at the front line of those people who are determined to make this happen. And if enough people are determined, it will happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I've not gone into kind of strategies this morning, we've barely scratched the surface of this topic. And I toyed the idea with looking at many quotes. Uh, from the world's traditions, but I, I kind of take it as read, right? Because uh, that's there, you can know those things. Uh, I want to share with you, oh, please, just one little uh, quotation. Because I s decided to select one mm. and um, ask you just to uh, consider this in your wisdom. There we go. Okay. Now after this, or as you, as I read this to you, I'm going to ask you, do you know where this comes from? Do you know where this comes from? You are a citizen of the world and a part of it. Not a subservient part, but a principal part. You are capable of comprehending the divine order. It should be principal part, P-A-L, my yeah, yeah, apologies. Yeah. But it gets you to think of it a little bit more. Right? Yeah, please. You are capable of comprehending the divine order and of considering the connection of things. What then does the character of a citizen, this kind of world citizen, promise? To hold no private interest, to deliberate about nothing as a separate individual, but like the hand and foot, which if they had reason and understood the constitution of nature, would never pursue or desire anything without reference to the whole being. Who would produce something like that? Well, it may or may not surprise you. You have to go back to Epictetus. Right? This is 55 to 135 AD, one of the Stoic philosophers. Wow. Uh, so this is the Hellenic culture contributing that kind of... When I first saw this, if I hadn't seen the... Uh, the 
the, the author, I thought well, maybe Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or somebody like that was talking, but no, these ideas are not new, but they're resurfacing again at this time, everybody, for a very good reason. We have one world, right? But I often started my uh, lectures, especially to young people, with a picture of our planet from space. Mm. Because it doesn't have what you're used to seeing, right? When you look at the classroom wall and you see these maps, mm. pink and yellow and green with lines all over them, <laughs> this political map of the world, right? We get so used to it. We think they're there, but when you look from space, strangely they're not there. Where are all the lines, right? Where do they come from? Well, of course, they, they're in here, right? They're in people's heads. That's where they are, right? So, uh, we see someone agree with us on that. Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Power of Myth, an American author, said, when you see the Earth from space, wait. You're right. <laughs> Just a little drum. <laughs> when you see the Earth from space, you don't see any divisions of nation states there. This may be the symbol of the new mythology to come. This is the country, this is the country we will celebrate, right? That is the country we will celebrate, and these are the people we are one with. Thank you very much, God bless you. Thank you.